Okay, great. So thanks for joining our uh, the talk to our work DPVAE, uh, Human Readable Text Anonymization for Online Reviews with Differentially Private Variational Autoencoders. Um, this is joint work between myself. I'm Ben Beckenman from SAP um, with my students Valentin, Michael and Justus, as well as with my supervisor Florian Kerschbaum from the University of Waterloo. Yeah, so um, we are talking about uh, basically text anonymization. Um, text is an ubiquitous medium and in particular online and in digital technologies, it's often used. And a prominent example uh, is online reviews, which are crowdsourced on many online platforms like uh, web shops such as Amazon, or also public review sites, uh, say Google Maps or Yelp for restaurant reviews and so forth. And, uh, but also non-publicly within companies or between companies where uh, your management and HR might do surveys um, among employees to see how they can improve things within the company, for instance. Um, yeah, so the goal of this is to improve services, products, brand image, or the working conditions maybe. And uh, that's why people collect this data and uh, they might also be uh, want to actually use machine learning or other computerized technologies to process this data. Um, the problem is if you are expressing as the customer or employee too critical feedback, um, this might lead to retaliatory actions or legal disputes. And uh, even if there is no legal action, there might be some like uh, indirect consequence that is like not taking the legal road, but still you might suffer or be punished for actually saying your honest uh, objective feedback. So this, if this is the case, then you might be reluctant to actually provide your feedback in the first place. And this is of course bad because then as the company, uh, you cannot uh, use this feedback to improve your services. So what we need in this case is some form of privacy protection for the users. And um, yeah, so uh, to encourage the people to give their honest feedback and so you can act upon it. And most platforms actually do allow to provide feedback uh, anonymously, but anonymous in this case means you can post your review under a pseudonym. So it's not, Strictly speaking, it's not really anonymous, it's only a pseudonym. And this is insufficient because the data itself, which is in this case the review text, can be sufficient to identify you among, say, a group of uh, suspects. And uh, the technique to do that is called authorship attribution. And it looks at your writing style, uh, at the grammar you're using, or which uh, syllables or tenses and verbs you're using more often than some other people. And this kind of leaves a stylistic fingerprint by which you could be identified. And as a countermeasure, there is a set of techniques called authorship obfuscation, which tries to modify the actual texts in such a way that these authorship attribution techniques don't really work anymore so that you cannot be re-identified anymore. And uh, for us, uh, we try to ideally also provide formal privacy guarantees and the current gold standard way to do that is uh, called differential privacy, which we've seen already in earlier talks today. And uh, the thing with unstructured data, such as text in particular is, well, uh, yeah, the existing approaches show that it's challenging because uh, they typically apply differential privacy not to an entire text. Uh, they only work word by word in a sequence of words, uh, which constitutes your text. And by this, this can cause several undesired effects. So, um, ah, sorry, the graphic is over the text. Um, so it might, may produce incoherent output because you perturb each word individually and you don't really consider the context. Um, the other case that can happen is the output is just a bag of words. So you're completely losing the order of your words, the grammar, and it's not really human readable anymore. And uh, in some cases, the 
differential privacy guarantees in the existing works, they actually only cover texts of the same length. So you have to guarantee if all your texts are 10 or 20 words long, but if you have one text which is 10 characters long and another which is 20 character, uh, sorry, words long, could be characters as well, but words for now, um, then the guarantees don't really cover these two inputs of different length. So this is our challenge that we try to solve in our work. And in our work, we try to kind of synergetically combine variational autoencoders, which is a type of uh, neural network and uh, differential privacy. So what it's not for these who know differential privacy in the context of machine learning, a famous technique is uh, training machine learning uh, uh, neural networks with differentially private stochastic gradient descent. And uh, this makes the training differentially private. This is not what we are going to do in this talk with variational autoencoders, but this could be used as a complementary technique. So just uh, note in advance. So why do we want to use variational autoencoders? Well, um, there is this paper from by Baumann et al. from 2015. Uh, generating sentences from a continuous space. So on the left, you see uh, sentences generated from a deterministic autoencoder, not a variational one. And uh, you can see that it doesn't always produce uh, sentences with proper grammar and consistency and so forth. And uh, this is because the latent space in deterministic autoencoders can have gaps where the decoder doesn't produce proper meaningful sentences. And uh, vari variational autoencoders try to improve on that by actually making this latent space dense or continuous. And by this, well, ideally, each point in the latent space would uh, be decoded to a somewhat meaningful, grammatically correct sentence. I know this is very idealistic, but the uh, VIEs go into this direction. So this is why we want to use this technique. And yeah, so differential privacy has been around as a notion of privacy since about 20, uh, 2006. And uh, original central model says, well, you have two inputs A and B, which are data sets or databases that differ in one record. Uh, that's one person's data, so to say. And then you have this uh, definition a mechanism uh, which is a randomized algorithm is uh, differentially private if it produces the same outputs on these two uh, similar inputs with almost the same probabilities. So this uh, factor e to the epsilon basically determines your privacy loss and then delta is a form of uh, differential privacy called approximate differential privacy, which gives you some kind of amount of exceptions that can violate this epsilon differential privacy. Um, What's a bit limiting in this case is that this requires a trusted curator who collects all this data from the different users in a central database. So in our case, this would be a trusted curator who collects all the reviews and the users have to trust the central curator that the curator doesn't try to identify the users if it's supposed to be anonymous. So Ideally, we would also like to switch to a different model of differential privacy called the local model, which we've also seen in previous talks in this session, if you've attended. And uh, it gets rid of this requirement that you need a, a trusted curator. And uh, uh, the definition basically is the same as central differential privacy, except that you can take any two inputs that uh, don't necessarily differ in a record and they don't even have to be data sets, uh, in our case, they will be the individual's review texts. So this is the model that we are going to use in this work. And now the remaining question is, well, what, how do such mechanisms look like that uh, actually fulfill this definition of differential privacy? And the famous one, uh, not the first one, the most prominent one is the Laplace mechanism, but uh, we'll be using the Gaussian mechanism here. And it's called that way because it applies Gaussian noise to the input. And um, yeah, your input is some function and then you apply zero centered Gaussian noise with some variance. And the variance of standard deviation is determined by the desired privacy parameters, epsilon and delta 
according to what privacy guarantees you would like to have. And you can generalize this to a multivariate instance. So in multi, uh, yeah, in, in higher dimensional data, you can also apply the Gaussian mechanism. Okay, so that's the part about differential privacy. And now let's open the box of the variational autoencoder. And uh, how it works is like this. It's a neural network. You have your input X, which is a sequence of words, and uh, you have some embedding layer and so forth. Then you have an, a deterministic encoder network, and this will produce uh, basically two outputs. One is a mean vector mu and a standard deviation or variance vector sigma. And then this is the specialty about variational autoencoders. It will take mu and sigma as parameters of a normal distribution and sample the latent vector set from there. And this sample is set through a decoder network. In case of text or sequential data, it's typically one that iterates until you uh, approach some stop of uh, sentence token or end of sentence token. And this will produce your output uh, sequence. And uh, this, well, the, the loss is, the training loss is uh, such that the reconstructed sequence uh, hopefully looks like the input sequence. And then you also have the KL term, which kind of forces this um, Latin distribution to be close to a standard Gaussian that is centered at zero and has variance one. Yeah, so question. Um, well, Gaussian noise, Gaussian mechanism. This, this looks like, well, nice synergy. Why can't, can we use this? Uh, already in the variational autoencoder, the contained noise, can we use this to achieve differential privacy? And uh, yeah, the, the answer is, well, almost, not quite. We have to do uh, some modifications um, to achieve differentially private inference via variational autoencoders. And the first thing we need to do is we have to bound the mean um, as to obtain a finite sensitivity. This is what we saw earlier on the Gaussian mechanism slide. And then the Gaussian, Gaussian mechanism requires a variance and the variance also cannot depend on the input X. So we have to kind of force it to a fixed variance all the time, no matter what input you use. So you do constrain somehow this uh, latent sampling in the VAE, but only to a tiny bit, like you don't, change it too much. And um, if you do this, then you actually get an instance of the Gaussian mechanism here that is basically applied to your um, encoding the mean vector obtained from the encoded input X. So what does this do? Like how does this change things in the Latin space? Um, so on the left, you basically see an illustration how a normal variational autoencoder looks like, and uh, you have the um, you, you have like some example points, and they can be anywhere. Like the mean vectors can be anywhere; they don't have to be that close to the zero coordinate. They are just encouraged by the KL loss to be close to the origin, but they don't have to. They could still be arbitrarily far away, especially because the encoder network is continuous, then maybe you could produce artificially an input X that shifts mu of X further and further away from the origin. Um, and this is uh, what the first DP constraint does. It bounds the mean so that it always stays within some predetermined radius R. And the nice thing is, well, if you choose this R to be something like three times the uh, standard deviation of the original prior distribution in a VAE, then you don't lose too much of the expressiveness of the latent space because over 99% of the probability mass of a normal distribution are within three standard deviations of uh, that probability distribution. So this constraint actually, if, if R is three times sigma and sigma is one for the prior, so if R is three, then you are actually quite good because you, you don't restrict this whole thing too much. Yeah, and the other thing is we constrain the standard deviation. So uh, 
all the ellipses uh, will become perfect circles and they all have basically this, like all the distributions of the encoded data where you sample your latent vectors set from, they will all have the same standard deviation. Okay, so this is our architecture for differentially private inference with um, a variational autoencoder. And now we want to use this to obfuscate textual data. And uh, as mentioned, we are looking at online reviews. And so we took some data sets uh, that are public from IMDB and Yelp, and they do come uh, both with uh, labels for who is the reviewer. So it's either a user ID, some pseudonymous ID, or maybe even their email address. I don't remember, but I think it's some ID. And they also come with labels that we use as a utility, namely the rating or the uh, sentiment of the review, if it's positive or negative. And uh, we will also use exactly these labels in, a, in our evaluation to see how good our obfuscation methods work. So for utility, we built a sentiment classifier that takes as input some text, either the original or an obfuscated text that has been obfuscated by our model. And then it tries to predict the sentiment. And for evaluating privacy or the attack, we see how well from the text you can predict the author's uh, user ID. And then this is not in the talk, but in the paper, we also measure the text quality and content preservation with some metrics like Meteor, Sentence Bird, Use, Embeddings, and the perplexity. Um, the first three we compare always between the original texts and the obfuscated outputs. Um, we also consider two attacker models. Um, first, we have a static attacker that's trained on the original and predicts on obfuscated data and an adaptive one because we assume the method is public. So um, the attacker could create his own obfuscated data and train better authorship classifiers and this actually helps and improves the attack. So this should be done, I think, in many other privacy related studies where it's not done previously. And we construct or evaluate several models, a vanilla variational autoencoder without modifications, then a VAE with exactly what I've presented before, the DP constraints enabled. And then there is another work by uh, John et al. They um, describe an adversarial autoencoder, which disentangles the latent space into a content part and an author or style part. And we also use that and compare our method to that. And we modify this disentangling autoencoder by only applying the DP constraints to the author latent vector. Yeah, and what we can see in the result is uh, you get with increasing sigmas, uh, increasing noise, lower uh, privacy losses, you increase um, you, you, yeah, uh, sorry, you, you reduce the attack probability or the at attack success rate, but with our, uh, so the EPVAE, you also reduce the utility because the noise is applied to the overall latent space. So you kind of destroy utility and uh, privacy. And uh, this, is, this is annoying. This is a, an effect of local differential privacy actually. And uh, the better way is if we use the disentangled version, we can apply the DP constraints only to the author part, which is the privacy sensitive one. And we see that the utility remains high until really large amounts of noise are injected. Yeah, and uh, here are some example sentences, but I look at the time and I should speed up. So, um, yeah, you can see that the output is at least somewhat readable. Um, there, it's, it's arguable that it could still be improved, which is actually for the work we are trying to do. But you can see that you still get readable results, which make some sense and uh, seem to maintain the content uh, of the texts, the originals. And about the privacy guarantee, well, we have our best models that we used um, we have the following values for sigma depending on the model and this translate to epsilon delta dp guarantees 
with uh, epsilon between just below one and just a bit above uh, below 35. So since we're in the local model, which always typically needs higher values for epsilon, I think this is a, a quite reasonable range, uh, particularly because it processes unstructured data uh, such as text in this case. Yeah, so to summarize, we proposed DP constraints that lead to our differentially private variational autoencoder architecture. And this allows developing obfuscation methods for unstructured data. And here we did this in the example of textual data to get readable text obfuscation with, differentially pri with differential privacy guarantees. And we saw that it effectively can effectively can reduce re-identification risks while preserving the content. And uh, what we didn't see, but it's typically a slightly better trade-off than the average uh, adversarial autoencoder by John et al. Yeah, so thanks for uh, bearing with me so long. And uh, now if you have questions, please ask. <laughs>